So good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Adam Aronson. I'm from Full City Consulting. I'm the president and founder there. And uh, frankly, this is my first time on stage at DevCon. <clears throat> it's, it's actually, I've been coming to DevCon so long and haven't been on stage that so many people have said to me this week, wait, you've never spoken? And I thought, oh, if I had a couple more years, you all might have just forgotten that that never happened. So. Hopefully I live up to your expectations. Um, <clears throat> so I'm here to talk to you about, I saved this, this time, and why it took me so long to get here, is that I saved the time for a couple of uh, subjects that I'm really passionate about and they really deeply uh, mean a lot to me. This first one today is also a very personal thing to me. It's about um, my sales process and how that evolved from growing up with my dad, who was a sales veteran, a hardcore sales veteran, and then as I transformed into a different, uh, into a consultant, what that transformation looked like. And <clears throat> throughout this, I hope to pepper in some ideas and some things that you'll all take away and use as part of your sales process. Um, my sales process is relatively informal, and I think that'll come across in, in what I'm talking about here today. So professionally, I'm this guy, or at least I thought I was at 10 years old or so. Um, I've got about 25 years, give or take, in the FileMaker space, working with FileMaker. Uh, 17 of those years, the foundation this October will be 17 years for Full City Consulting, and uh, 10 years of those actually managing a team uh, of developers. And the part of my job that I love the most, and I think this is a, a moniker that I can't remember whether some of you came up with this or whether I did, I'll take the credit though because I'm that guy, um, is this concept of being the client whisperer. The thing that I love more than anything else is talking to our clients and getting to know them and working with them. And I think that'll come across in some of the things that I'm saying today. So personally, I am a proud father and husband. Um, when that's my, uh, my avocational expertise is, is in being a father and a husband. And when I'm not in the woodwork, I'm sorry, when I'm not in the, uh, in the file maker space, I'm an avid woodworker. And for me, I think this probably resonates with a lot of you who are here, the creativity, the concept of uh, raw materials, transforming them into an Id a visual idea, right, or a concept and making something out of it. Does that sound familiar? Right? So this is, yeah, this is something that uh, I'm pretty passionate about. Speaking about passion, um, there's a word in Japanese, otaku. For those of you who, know, who might know this word, otaku is about like almost, uh, it comes up a lot in the cosplay and the anime uh, realm of like somebody who uh, has an almost unhealthy obsession with something. So uh, keeping it a little bit technical today, I'm gonna use a recursive uh, function here and say that I am otaku about Japan. <laughs> and I think some of you might have known this if you follow me on social media. It's, it's quite evident, I don't really hide it very well. And last but not least, um, music. I think like many of you, music is a huge piece of my life and uh, I consider myself an armchair musicologist. Okay, so we start this story today with this guy. This is my dad. That picture is probably vintage uh, 1982 or so. And um, my dad was born and bred and uh, infused in his fiber with Brooklyn. Uh, my dad lived in Brooklyn back at a time when you didn't need a beard longer than your hair to show that you lived in Brooklyn as part of that outfit. And <clears throat> he, my father worked in the Schmata business. Show of hands, shmata, everybody familiar, anybody familiar with that word? Not enough. So uh, shmata is Yiddish for rags. And what it really, even though it's Yiddish for rags, like many words, foreign words, it takes on a different meaning. In um, the Eastern European culture of, of immigrants in the, around the turn of the century, there were a lot of people who were merchants, and specifically in the garment uh, business. The garment business in New York is a culture. And my father was very much at the center of that culture uh, at its heyday in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And that culture uh, is something that, it, there was a lot that, from that culture that I took on. A lot of the things that I started my basic foundations came from that, and I think you'll see some of that when I talk about it with you. This guy loved to sell. It might have been his otaku. Um, he was really crazy about selling and he had more than, I think, almost 40 years of professional sales experience. His line to me, always about how great a salesman was, was he would tell me, hey, I could sell a concrete canoe if I wanted to. So that's the, that's the person who gave me the, the background. That's the guy who I grew up with. Um, 
as a child and growing up into my years, some of the things I learned from my dad was fundamentally be a people person. I don't know if there's something you go to school for. I think it's something that um, you know, inherently you have to enjoy and you really have to love people. And that was something, I don't think I had a choice. Um, I was in a family that spent a lot of time socializing, so I became uh, very much a people person. As a result of that, being around so many people all the time, I, I don't really kind of understand the concept of um, intentional networking. This is a foreign concept to me. How do you intentionally get out and meet people? It's just something I learned to do naturally from, from being around my, my dad. And through that, the kind of the, the lubrication of the networking is the schmooze, right? It's just the, 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 the constant communication, the getting to know people through talking to them. Okay, a lot of times this word might have a, a, a connotation, negative connotation of being like, trying to talk somebody into something, but that's not, that's not what I came up with. <clears throat> and last but not least, my dad was a negotiator. Um, a, a hardcore negotiator. But his ultimate goal and what he described as, as what was important to him about negotiation was that a negotiation needed to end with a win-win. Both parties needed to make compromise and, and, and uh, benefit on an equal level. Of course, privately, my dad would tell you he wanted to, to win more. <laughs> but the win-win was still that kind of compromise and that flexibility was a big part of, of who he was and what I walked away with from there. So let's fast forward. Um, I'm about 24 years old. Uh, I have these skills, and I happen to, believe it or not, love gear, right? Developed a, an appreciation for gear. So what does a guy who has these skills and love gear, what does he do? Well, he falls into um, high-end audio sales, audiophile audio sales. And this was, uh, this, was in total, this was my first sales experience, right? I, didn't, I, I just knew I was gonna be a salesman. I had no idea what that really meant. So the combination of being that person who loved to mesh with people and talk about this stuff, right? That was, that was me at my heart, and I really enjoyed that very much. What I didn't know was that as a salesperson, you actually had to sell, <laughs> and that there was a transaction and there was money involved in that. So all these concepts of metrics and the things that I needed to live up to, these came into my being, into, you know, into this position of mine, and I, I struggled. With, with it a little bit. I wasn't consistently always the number one salesman. I, I did it a few times, but I, there were these killers in my team, right? There were guys who, it was all about moving boxes. And so, as I started to kind of adapt to that and started to get better at that, I was evolving, right? Now I was the schmoozer, I could talk about the gear, and now I could also start to learn about what it meant to, you know, things like profit margin and, and what was the importance of having these metrics. Yet, as time went on, and I started to own that process, started to get comfortable with it, I think the most significant shift in my life, in my early eight, my life happened, which was, you know, I loved, I loved audio, I loved music, I made that clear, and I loved the gear. And what happened was, I was noticing that the better gear sounded better. Um, typically, better gear, less profit margin. Typically, better audio gear is um, harder to manufacture. It's, it's manufacturing lead time is longer. So this frustrated my management. Here's this guy who cares about what people actually, the benefits that they're getting and what they hear and what they want. Um, he's, you know, a, he's doing well, but he's not, he, he's not moving boxes. His profit margin is lower. However, something that came out of that was a development and an understanding of how did, how did I sell them the better gear, right? How did I get to the point where I really understood, rather than just saying, oh, you want a CD player? Here's five, which one's a nice color? Which one do you like that looks better? Which one, it's, you know, what's the same, a, a brand you recognize? I started to transform into getting to know my customers, because I was there for a while, and actually, because I was such a music fan, I started to really care about what kind of music they listened to, and frankly, what were the benefits, right? What were they looking for? And so it became a little bit more of a protracted sales process, and I started to listen and process more. And as a result of that, it was clear to me that while margin is important, and many of the hardcore salesmen in the room might say to me, oh God, this guy doesn't sell margin, I hate those guys. But in, in, in effect, what was happening was the experience that my customers were getting was more important to me than the margin I was making and frankly, the commission. 
we had, as I mentioned earlier, we had some killers on our team. There were guys who were just, you know, they, they would float around the room on Christmas Eve and they would be picking up all the stragglers. I mean, they were, they were professionals, they were hitmen. And while I appreciated that and I understood all of that, that wasn't me. Who I was, was the guy who had the most repeat business and I was also the guy who had the most referrals. Rep, you know, other people coming in saying, hey, you're the guy who sold my uncle something, I wanna talk to you. That's what made me happy. And while I saw that I was a salesperson and I was living in this world, I was starting to re recognize in myself that the experience of what people were getting out of what was happening in our transaction was more important to me. So what does this mean? I, I kind of look at this as the pivot point. I became a audio, from, I went from being an audio salesperson to an audio consultant, right? Because of that listening, because of that depth of experience and how important that was to me. So after having that experience, I think I was there for about three years, I, needed, I wanted to take this to the next level. Um, coincidentally, that audio job was my intro to the FileMaker world. That, that uh, business, the owner's brother was a Macintosh consultant. That sounded like the coolest job in the world, right? <laughs> in 1990, I wanted to be that guy. And so what they did was they put a, uh, a Mac in every store. It was a Mac uh, SE, or SE30, I think. And that's what we, we did. We, we used FileMaker, and I, was, I fell in love, bought my first Mac. And so having that experience, the consulting thing happening, being entranced by this concept of a Macintosh consultant, I moved into a, a, a position with Apple as an educational sales consultant for the southern tier of New York State. Um, it wasn't a great time for, for selling Macs into schools, right? Apple was, it was the Gil Emilio days. It was kind of at an interesting time for, for Apple. Um, the, the equipment was clearly more expensive. Uh, the schools also in New York State at that time were on austerity budgets. So there wasn't a dime to spend. Um, so as a salesperson, I did what, was, what came natural to me or you know, as, as a consultant, and I actually pivoted it to managing my accounts more as opposed to trying to get them to buy equipment. It just wasn't equipment to be bought or money to be spent. So what happened was I, I focused more on the experience that people were having with the equipment. I knew they loved the equipment. I knew they had a job to do, and often I heard people talk about, oh, if you know, I, I, we can't buy equipment, but the principals and the, the secretaries and the technology advisors were asking me, how do I do better things with this equipment? Right? Enter FileMaker. Right? So now I was really being that Mac consultant, being that FileMaker, building little FileMaker things for people, using HyperCard, which I heard mentioned earlier today. Um, what was empowering for me and what I took away from this was the excitement around helping people, really directly impacting and, have, and seeing a much more direct connection of satisfaction than I ever saw in the audio days. So again, I'm progressing here, I'm feeling a lot more and I'm recognizing that, boy, that relationship, that connection, one-on-one -on -one with some of the people I'm working with was even another thing that kind of propelled me to the next level and really made me happy. So we'll fast forward through a couple of in-house positions, uh, in-house FileMaker developer positions, and uh, in 2000, October of 2000, I started Full City Consulting, right? Y2K, for those of you who remember. And now, I was in a different realm altogether. I had a network of people that I had been working with, I built a nice network, knew a lot of people, and had some FileMaker experience at one of those in-house jobs. I met my first FileMaker consultant, who returned to DevCon for the first time last year. That was fun catching up with him. And now, I had to take all of this experience that I had, and as a consultant, I needed to focus it on actually selling services and selling the, this concept. There was no more units, right? There was still profit margin and all those other components, but now this was the, the final part of the transformation. So this is, this is the point where we'll take all of this background, right, where I came from, the different parts of, uh, of my experience, and thinking these through, I th I, looking back, I think there are three superpowers that I relied on at the time, which came from my early experience and helped me, and I think as I talk to more and more people in the, in the FileMaker community and other technologies who are just kind of nascent in their sales experience, these are the things I think that I, I coach people on. I think the feedback I've gotten is that these are very helpful pieces. So let's talk about what they are. The first superpower is listening, right? Tuning in. Two ears, one mouth, we've all heard this. I remember the first time I heard it shaking my head. Two ears, one mouth, use them proportionally. 
the ability to be flexible is, I think, um, probably one of the pieces that I find people struggle with the most, is, is how to go from being an engineer or a creative person at heart, as we are, but yet employ some interpersonal flexibility in order to work more closely with your customers, and I'll talk more about that. And then last but not least is leveraging the power of relationships and what relationships mean and how to do that in such a way that's perfectly genuine, right? Is not targeted and false and, and manipulative. So when I think about listening, I think about how can, we, how can we use the listening power more and what can we do to strengthen our relationships with our, with our clients? And, and for that matter, with our colleagues, some of whom might be sitting over here, and with our families and friends, right? This is, this is the key to everything, is getting to know the people you work with. So here's, you know, my, my philosophy is that if you take away, if you strip down some of the business aspect and the relationships we have with some of the people we work with, I think as a, in, as a general rule in the FileMaker community, we're very fortunate. We probably all love our customers, right? So here's what I wanna ask you to do for a moment is, here's your homework, your exercise, is think, just keep in mind your favorite client. Just pop that cl favorite client, right, first, the front of mind. Now think about the traits, the, the aspects of that client that make them your favorite client. Okay, following along, everybody good? Now think of your least favorite client. Think of what you can do to bridge the gap by applying some of the things you've learned. How can you work and, and, and get to know your client in such a way that that least favorite client has some of the, how can you bring them along? Well, I would say one of the ways is just being more interpersonal with them. That's always been my experience. Another thing that's very key for me is, look, this is a, this is a digital age. And I'm sure everyone here has checked their email. Looks like Dave's doing it right now. Um, everybody here has checked their email at least once as we've been sitting here. Email is a force to be reckoned with. It is a tool that we all rely on. Um, I find that it, I, I consider it, I kind of look at it as like a two-dimensional. It's kind of flat. Right? Email is not where I have my most substantive conversations with our clients. Where I have my most substantive conversations is face-to-face -face or on the telephone. And I think to a large extent, we all kind of use the two. We've, I think it's been long enough now in the technology business, we use these two intentionally. Um, for the past few years, I've been focusing much more, part of the reason I'm up here to talk about is I've been focusing much more on this. I've actually been getting out and talking to clients. And what I've learned is as I visit more of our clients, um, I, I learn things that I wouldn't have learned in email, in text messaging. I see things that are able to give me ideas about how to expand the use of FileMaker, make better use of FileMaker. I learn culturally things that I would never pick up. So it, I, I can't say strongly enough, and mostly because, like I said, I've, I've really felt this and seen this work for me in this past year, is just to get out and speak to your clients more and more. And when you're doing that, this word, as I was uh, putting this presentation together, I was doing some research and talking with people, this word kept coming up. And I didn't really, I have to say, honestly, it was a bit of a, I had to shift my, my thinking for a minute because empathy for me was always about, you know, feeling for somebody when they're hurt or when they're happy. But I realized that, you know, this empathy, what empathy for me means in the context of what we do is really getting past the surface and getting to know people. Why, why are people struggling with what they're struggling with, right? Feeling the frustration and the, and the tension that some of our customers exist, uh, uh, ex uh, experience. Um, the person, one of the people I spoke to about this directed me to an article on Quartz.com. I uh, believe the author's name was Tracy Chow. And Tracy was a software engineer and a product developer and product manager. And she, went, she was working for Quora in Quora.com in its early days. And she talked about um, a problem that they had. They had about 1,000 users. And people were already experiencing what I call the Twitter effect. They were already experiencing all the negativity, right? The, the people hiding behind the account to direct attacks and be negative. And their team became somewhat, I'm paraphrasing here, but their team became somewhat overwhelmed 
when they thought, oh my God, this is disastrous, what are we gonna do about this? And Tracy talks in this article about the way she came up with the solution, which is pretty obvious as you think about it in hindsight, was that she actually empathized. She put herself in the position of one of those people and realized all they needed was a block button. It's a simple solution, but you know, there was some agitation in their team, like how do we get to that? So I think that's, that was a big takeaway for me, is sometimes when I'm, you know, we're, like I said, we're, we're part engineer, part artist, I think, in our business, and as we focus on the engineer part and we wanna have all the answers, sometimes we look beyond what the motivation is, what's the, what's the hook that we can use to, to come up with a, sometimes, right, uh, Occam's razor, a simple solution. One word question that I think is, was uh, just a great evolution in my uh, sales process and in, in my account management with my clients. This question is the, probably the most important question you can ask when you're engaging with a client who wants to use FileMaker or has ideas for how to do things. This is, the, this, is not, this is hard for us, I think, a lot of times to focus on because this gets to a deeper connection of like why people are asking us to do something. So I was talking with somebody from FileMaker yesterday and they were saying, you know, we, we heard you speak recently and you were talking about you know, how sometimes when you first meet with a client, one of the first questions, it's almost off-putting, or not off-putting, but you know, disarming, is to say, you know, why are you thinking about FileMaker for this particular task? And it, 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 that's the exact reason I ask, <laughs> is because I wanna know what, the, you know, what's the, what are the solid reasons. I wanna get right to the core of what is motivating this person, what are the problems they're trying to solve, and frankly, the answer to this is something I want to know that if I'm able to reach, the, if somebody gives me the answer, well, we want, we're doing this because of X, Y, and Z, I want to make sure that X, Y, and Z is achievable. I want to make sure that it's something we can do. At Full City Consulting, I have a sort of a quirky saying. I say our philosophy is flexibility. Um, I was talking with Chuck Melton, who's sitting over here yesterday, and he was um, kind of pressing me a little bit on something I said, which was, you know, I don't really have a sales process. And what I meant by that is, I kind of look at each situation, each engagement with a new client differently, okay? So that means um, there's a lot of different ways this comes across, right? And so one of those would be willing to negotiate. So let's get back to what my dad said about this win-win. And, and what does it mean to have, but, but willing to negotiate. By willing to negotiate, I mean is willing, being willing to sometimes find a satisfactory compromise. It's not about negotiating price. I mean, it's the first thing I think a lot of us think when we see this word negotiate is, well, I'm just gonna lower my rate, or I'm gonna raise the rate, or I'm gonna, get whatever, whatever it is. Making some kind of, uh, making some kind of uh, stepping back, right, and, and, and giving something back, giving up something. It's not that. It's really about this. It's about ebbing and flowing, right? It's really about going with the flow, I think is the, the best way I could put it. Jason Mundock once said to me, be a chameleon. And originally the graphic I had for this slide was a chameleon, chameleon in his honor. And the, what that meant, what that means to me, it resonated deeply with me. Again, this means to put yourself, use empathy, use your negotiation, your flexibility to kind of acclimate to your client, to the culture, right? Get to, get to be a part of that culture. Again, this is reinforced by on-site visits. I think that's part of what I said about getting to know different parts cultural about your customer. But ad adaptability, don't be rigid. Just try not to be. There are times and places for rigid, and I will tell you, I can be a, a rigid uh, guy <laughs> when I have to be. But for the most part, I think really working with our clients is about being adaptable and finding that there's um, something unique about each one of these engagements. So, quick story about this. When I was uh, very early on in, in my FileMaker career, probably 2003, 2002, I had just finished a, a project, probably one of the bigger projects I had ever completed on my own for a, a customer in a specific industry. And within weeks or days of almost of like the completion slash deployment of that project, I got a call from another customer in the same industry. And I thought, boom, slam dunk, <laughs> copy paste, right? I had all these delusions of 100% profit margin, right? 
And so what did I do? Well, I was new, and I was still a little rough around the edges, so I brought that to when I went to visit with the client and I met with them, I actually kind of took on that, yeah, I know what you do. Yeah, I got that, I know that. Yeah, by the way, you do this, right? And uh, in hindsight, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't really see it at the time. Got through the, you know, got through the proposal stage, got to the day where we finally said we're gonna move forward with this project, I was lucky, as I found it. Because I went out that night with one of the two partners, the night we agreed to everything, and we went out for a couple drinks. And we're in the midst of conversation. He said to me, can I give you a word of advice? He said, we didn't hire you because you had experience with this other industry. We, had, we hired you because we really liked the way you engaged with us and you were working, willing to work with us and you saw through some things. He said, but I can't tell you how, in, in the beginning, it was how almost we were dissuaded to work with you because of the fact that you used your experience with another business in our business, projected that onto us, and we felt like we were being marginalized and trivialized. Right, great lesson. And so what, I would, what I've learned from that is that I do really try to walk into every new engagement with a client as if it's the first time, right? Fresh eyes every time. And I'm just gonna underscore this one more time. I know it's kind of cheating to have two bullets, two of the same bullets on two slides, but I can't say enough that part of this flexibility component is about employing the empathy, is about employing, trying to get to know beneath what some of the reasons are and the things that people are talking to you about. And last but not least, relationships. This, I think I'm fortunate in that I love people, some of them. I think, <laughs> I think that's worked well to my advantage. Um, but I do believe at the same time that even if it doesn't, isn't something that comes natural to you and you, you tend to be a little bit more introverted, that there, there's still a way to employ this superpower. And it's through just sticking to a couple of real kind of primary uh, fundamentals. Asking for referrals is something that I was super uncomfortable with for the longest time. I just, I felt like it wasn't the right thing. Like I was asking for somebody to, to go out of their way. It just didn't sit well. I started to do a little bit more, I started to try to work around it. <clears throat> and one day I went to see a client and I walked in early uh, on a meeting in a conference room and the owner of the company was sitting and talking to one of his colleagues, one of, one of his coworkers, and he was talking about this event that he had been to. And he went on to describe this event as being one that was, it wasn't industry specific, but there were a lot of like C-level people, and we're not talking C-level thousand people companies, we're talking about 200 level, you know, 200 people companies. And there were a lot of those people at this barbecue slash day long event. <clears throat> and I was listening to that and saying, well, I wonder if he told, how many of them he told about his success that we've had together. And then something kind of snapped. And when he was done talking, I said, hey, it sounded like you had a really, you know, kind of an interesting event there. That sounds like it was a great place. I said, really, were there other people, kind of your peers? He said, yeah. He said, and he prompted me and said, you know, while I was there, I got to tell a couple people about the work we're doing here together. And I said, wow. I said, how do, how do I get to, in front of those people to share this experience we've had and, and, you know, talk about it together? And he said, well, let me tell you. And he gave me some information. Sure enough, I got to some of those people. Two leads and I think two jobs came out of that. What was, what, in, in thinking it through, kind of analyzing it after the fact, I thought, wow, I'm, there was a piece there, I think actually, is Matt still here? Matt had said something, there you are. So Matt had once pointed out to me something, this concept of uh, if you're, in a, if you're in, in, with somebody who you're working with, and if you compliment them, it actually gives you credibility, right? To compliment somebody else on their good work. Am I getting this right? And I thought that, that's what was happening here, right? He was excited about it, and by, kind of by default, he was telling people about the good work we did, and if I got in front of those people and was able to share it, it kind of triangulated, and it was a little bit of a love fest could have result from that. So, the second thing I wanna talk about, this is, um, this is something I love. This is a really great technique, and I would encourage all of you, some of you have heard it before, I would encourage all of you to, to try this out. It's along the same lines. So, occasionally, often, we get a referral from uh, either another technology partner, sometimes one of you, 
uh, sometimes an Apple store will refer us to a client and say, oh, we, Full City Consulting, they do X, Y, and Z, and they could help you with, we think they can help you with what you're trying to do. And so we, you know, engage with the customer, success, hopefully, more than likely. And at the end of that, what I do is I kind of bundle up that story and bring it back to the person who was the original referrer. Right, so I, what I, this is what I call closing the loop. Um, I, I know a lot of you know I'm a storyteller, and I apologize in advance or in, <laughs> in hindsight for some of that. But storytelling is a really powerful, it, it's, look, it's a cultural phenomenon, right? It is a powerful mechanism. And what I have done is I have leveraged that in such a way that a couple of things are achieved. One is I go back to the person who referred me, and I give them a snapshot of what we do. What does a FileMaker consultant do, right? So now they're a little bit more educated. Next time they gave me a referral, they're gonna know a little bit more about what I do and they're gonna qualify, almost pre-qualifying their, their referrals. The second thing is, I make them feel really good. Who doesn't love hearing that they did a solid for somebody else, right? Who doesn't love that? And also, again, it acknowledges for everybody that kind of the same thing that I said about this client and the referral con uh, concept is it kind of gives everybody a little bit of extra boost in credibility. So I encourage you, if you have success stories, tell them, bundle them up, let people know what the benefits are, educate them on what you do, and, and just taking a small snapshot of something you did for somebody that was really great and made an impact on their business. I know the case study thing isn't uncommon, right? I'm sure a lot of you know that concept, but focusing that into a, hey, let me, let me show you what we did for that customer you referred us to. That's really worked well for us, I have to say. Last but not least about when it comes to relationships and um, working a, a quote unquote network, I have a, this is kind of an anecdotal story, but I think it, it underscores something that's, um, it underscores a few points that we've talked about and a few things that we experience in our business. So we had a not so great client, um, probably for a long time. There was something endearing, so I kept them around because I, kind of, I actually liked the owner of the business, but it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a great fit, and it, wasn't, uh, it was arduous, <laughs> putting, it, you know, putting it lightly. So fast forward years later, um, we're called in to a, uh, a, a few of us in the New York area are called in to interview with a financial firm that's looking for a uh, FileMaker, for some help with FileMaker. And so I go through the process, right? I meet with them, I think twice, and then the final, I get the final call, hey, can you come back in with us? Can you bring your proposal and can you present to us what your, you know, potentially what your solution is? So I went through that. There were 18 guys in the room, all in ties, a very high mirrored building. And at the end of it, they said, great, you know, we want to move forward with you and et cetera, et cetera. So I got the green light. Everybody exits the room except for the uh, managing director of that department. And he closes the door, and I said, hey, you know, thanks. And he said, great. He goes, let me tell you a funny story. He said, so my wife is a, an executive in bio, I think it was biotech. And he said, she's been for a long time looking to make that next big jump and make in, in that next big leap in her career. And we've been working with a recruiting consultant, not a recruiter, but somebody who helps position her in the right firms with con recruiters and whatnot. He said, and she's married to this guy, and she said his name. And I, I thought for myself, I'm, I'm, this is a dream. There's no way I got this job. <laughs> it turned out to be this not so great client. Completely random. But he said, you know, over the course of dinner, he talked about his business. He said, I've got this great tool, this thing called FileMaker. And he said, oh, we're looking at FileMaker. Who are you talking to? Full City Consulting and Adam Aronson. He's great. This was a guy who, I, in the same position, I might not have had such kind words. But nonetheless, so this is just, I just want to underscore that you never know, right? The burn bridges, all that kind of thing. And it's very delicate. It's not to say that this doesn't bite us sometimes, but I think more often than not, you know, my daughter, is, my nine-year-old daughter is fond of saying, Daddy, you never know what's right around the corner. So I want to recap, walk you through some of these concepts. Let's think back. So I think I made it clear. I think this listening, understanding, is really at the heart of what we do. And it's a muscle that I think you need to continually exercise because it is, I think, a fundamental tool for us. Listening to our customers, we're not there to 
Our, I think our, our, and our, let me say this about this. Our temptation, look, we've got the coolest technology tool in the world, I think, and we love it so much that we like to talk about it and we like to really talk to, about it to people and maybe in ways that they don't always connect because we're so otaku about FileMaker. So I'd encourage you to kind of sit back on that and just you know, gather some more information so that you can put the right otaku in the right place and the right emphasis about what, how great FileMaker is in the right place. The ability to tack, you know, and this is, look, this is, this, uh, forgive me for being so bold, but this might be a really good life lesson, right? Just be flexible and adaptable. Just go with the flow. And our clients are challenged these days, right? I'm sure a lot of us are seeing this. Um, payment terms just seem to get bigger and bigger. People are looking to do less with more. I know that's a cliche, but I, I mean, I'm seeing it and feeling it. So because our customers are challenged in ways I think that they haven't been challenged before, and we're vendors assisting them and providing services to help them manage that, it just means that there's more of a demand on us to emphasize, you know, to be that flex, ex, I'm sorry, exert that flexibility and, and that adaptability. And look, <laughs> relationships, you know, again, I, I'm, I, maybe I'm projecting a little bit here, but that discomfort I had about leveraging relationships and how intentional and ucky that feel, felt to me, I think the fact of the matter is, is that's what really, that's the, that's the engine, right? That's what makes business go, is getting to know people. I mean, I walk around here, and I, gosh, I know so many of you. I feel like I don't have to say hello anymore because I feel like I said hello to you just a year ago. And maybe at my age, that just seems like a smaller period of time. But look, it is, you know, why do we love this event? It's because we're all together and because of the way we all work together. Even though we're not working for the same company, in a lot of ways, it feels like we are. So I always like to leave with a little bit of a, challenge in my last bullet. So one of the ways you can leverage your existing relationships is to find new ones. So it's hard to get out of your bubble and to get out of status quo. So find another network, right? Put yourself in a position somewhere, you know, like I did with my client in the referrals. Just look to make kind of a small hop over the fence to a pool that you don't know because there's probably a lot of opportunity there. There's probably a lot of work there too. But again, that's going to give you an opportunity to kind of almost have like, you know, another, another place to grow a tree and see how that works out and what, what the benefits are. And here's the bonus. Here's the bonus piece. I wrote a blog post about this for Elusive Moose a couple of months ago. Uh, I love this story. So when it comes to selling, and I know sales is, I mean, I think you could probably get a doctorate in sales these days. Um, it's a very broad subject. It means a lot of things to a lot of people. And it's the, by its nature, it's something that I think people study, hone. It's really a skill. But people who don't, who are new to it and haven't done it before, they, I don't think a lot of times they really know what it means. So case in point, my best friend's son is a guitar maker but he's also a lot of other things. He's 24, he should be a lot of other things. So he's doing a lot of different kinds of jobs. We were out one day and we were talking over uh, pizza at, at uh, Roberta's in Brooklyn, best. Um, I'm a New York guy, I had to throw a good pizza reference in. So we're, we're having pizza and we're talking about this and we're talking about passion and life and I'm, you know, look, I, it's, it's a bit vicarious, right? I'm out with a 24 year old kid and I wish I was out in that position again and had all those opportunities. He told me how much he loves to build guitars. And I said, so why don't you do that? Why don't you do more of that? Well, I'm, I don't know how to sell. So I said, I, I gave him, I just threw this out on the table. And it was kind of just one of these things I didn't really think about, but I just said it. I said, hey, Jesse, you love what you do? He said, yeah, I really do. I said, well, then start there. Just start by telling people, this is, I love what I do. I love building guitars. And my point was, now in hindsight, of course, I can make it sound like it was a scholarly idea and I think something I planned for months. But what I, what I focused on was, look, in this day and age in marketing, you hear words like authentic, uh, bespoke. That's one of my favorites. Some of you use that, by the way, for your bespoke FileMaker solutions, please. Um, <laughs> and you also hear authentic. And I get it, right? I get it. I'm a craftsman. So I get what that is. What, is, what does that mean? It means that when you intrinsically when you can show somebody the value of something by intrinsically adding passion to it, talking about how much you love it. And so I said to Jesse, look, if you do that, if you get out and do there, I'll do the rest for you and I'll promote you. See what I did? So this is, <laughs> this is his actual, this is actual guitar of his. But he, 
you know, that, that really, we both had kind of a love fest over that, and I think it was a really important thing. Again, in our space, we're very fortunate. We all, does anybody here not love what they do? Seriously. No, you don't have to feel bad. Yeah, I didn't think so. We, this, we're all very fortunate in this community to really love what we do, and I, I'll tell you, I think there's a correlation between that and the success of the platform. So, updates. The updates will come from you. And here's my email address, and I wanna hear about them. This is, a, I love this conversation. Again, I know it's, you know, it's very much about fundamentals and, and, and philosophy about who you are and, and, and how you portray that and what kind of value you offer and what does it mean to sell. But I wanna hear from people about, hey, these are unique ways that I sell, and this is something that happened to me. Stories, tell me stories, I love good stories. So I wanna hear from all of you. That, that's why my email address is up there. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, we're gonna have some Q&A, so please feel free to jump up and take the mic, and that's it. Marshall, you have a question? I do. Great, go for it. You have to step up to the mic. Come on, man. See what I just did there, by the way? I gave him credibility. Go ahead. Slide. Is this on? Yes. If it's not, you wouldn't tell me anyway, would you? Uh, no, I wouldn't. So slide one, you talked about your love for Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Japan, I'm told if you get a hole in one, you have to buy everybody golf clubs. So if this is your, we can do We can ask Koji for, uh, to speak to that. Say yes. So if this is my hole in one, uh, you tell me. This is your hole in, are you going to be buying us all drinks at the bar later? Absolutely. OK. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Michael. One of your uh, current or former, depending on how you describe it, New York counterparts. I, uh, I did some Sandler training in uh, New York City. What is that? I did some Sandler training, Sandler, Sandler sales Adam training. Adam Sandler? Um, maybe, okay. perhaps. But uh, the philosophy there is start with why. Um, the idea being just start with their pain point, figure out what's hurting. Would you say that you talk about empathy, when you're beginning a conversation with a client, um, how does that look? How do you actually begin the conversation you know, with the, the client? I do it differently every time. So I'll, I'll kind of push them all together. Right, it's that. I want to know why I'm there. Why did they reach out? Right, what are the kinds of things? What do they do? I'm not, I don't walk into a first meeting with an agenda. I rarely walk into a meeting with an agenda at all, much to the chagrin of some of the people who work for me, some of them sitting here, but um, I like to just kind of dialogue. It kind of goes with everything I said. Let's just find an entry, let's just find a, an entry point. If we don't, okay, well that's something I'm learning about this and I'll keep it in the back of my mind, but I'm just looking for a conversation to start. With that being said, to your point, why am I here? Why are we talking? I don't come out and say it that quite that well. Sometimes I do, but you know, appropriately, because it's New York, I might. But, you know, I look for that, you know, let's, let's just kind of get the ball rolling. Let's snowball this. Oh, yeah, please. I'm going to monopolize this uh, microphone for a minute. So when you're ready to talk numbers with them, dollars and cents, do you put it in front of them and say, okay, to accomplish these goals, it's just going to take X number of hours and here's the cost? Or do you, f how do you sell the, the cost? Do you frame it as in, you know, if we accomplish this goal, you'll eliminate the need to hire someone next year, so therefore your ROI is. How, how do you close the deal when the actual, when it gets to that cold point, when there's a number or an invoice on the table? So where appropriate, again, kind of, sorry to kind of come back to this, but where appropriate, yes, some customers are looking for direct ROI, we'll go that route. My philosophy in general, and I talk about this a little bit in the presentation I'm doing tomorrow, is um, it, we won't have a money conversation um, very, we're not going to wait. We're just going to start talking about money and value, and let's just let's just bring it into the part of the conversation. It's part of it. It's it's almost it's almost a side effect. You have to pay for it, and hopefully we're going to save you some money. So let's just start talking about that as part of the process, as part of everything from the very beginning. Uh, my other uh, other elusive moose blog post and a subject, another one that I'm really passionate about is the element of surprise. Right, business owners here. Can I see you raise your hands? Keep your hand up if you love surprise. OK, 
Okay, so case in point. And so because of that, I really try to keep this, I, I really try to pepper in this thread of what the cost could be. If, we're, if we, we wait on that conversation, if we, it happens too late, I don't, that's not me, I just don't like that style. Does that answer your question? You have to take, I was, I was asked to demand that you take the microphone. Okay, so you throw out an early number. Does that carry the risk of the client locking into that number and saying, that's the cost? Thank you for saying that, let me clarify. The last thing I do is walk in and say, oh, it's gonna cost you on day one now. I'm, I'm talking about building. I'm talking about building up to that cost. So giving them a sense early on of what things do cost, what they could cost. Bring, there's a lot of different forms of bringing that into the conversation. But yes, no, 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 no. And matter of fact, again, I think this might come up in some of the conversations tomorrow. I try to, as much as possible, not focus on cost. It's not, it's, it's important, it's, it's, yeah, it's there, right? It's kind of the, it's why we're doing it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I try to bring that along in the conversation and not, not just get, I, I certainly don't, I try my best, and this might sound squirrely and maybe it is, but I try not to get pinned down to a cost. I try to define a process and talk about how we manage cost within that process and what the potential costs are, are part of that conversation. 